I'm bringing the Bible reading tonight, and before I do, I want to apologise for every name that I get wrong uh, in the uh, following text. Pastor Ian has said for every word I mispronounce, I'll be on church discipline for a week. So see how I go. We're reading from Joshua chapters 16 and 17. Joshua chapters 16 and 17. The allotment for Joseph began at the Jordan of Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, and went up from there through the desert into the hill country at Bethel. It went on from Bethel, that is Luz, crossed over the territory of the Archites in Ataroth, descended westward to the territory of the Jephthites, as far as the region of Lower Beth Horon, and on to Giza, ending at the sea. So Manasseh and Ephraim, the descendants of Joseph, received their inheritance. This was the territory of Ephraim, clan by clan. The boundary of their inheritance went up from Atta Roth Adar in the east to Upper Beth Haron and continued to the sea. From Mikmethath on the north, it curved eastward to Tanath, Shiloh, passing by it to Genoa on the east. Then it went down from Genoa to Ataroth and Nara, touched Jericho and came out at the Jordan. From Tapua, the border went west to the Cana Ravine and ended in the sea. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the Ephraimites, clan by clan. It also included all the towns and their villages that were set aside for the Ephraimites within the inheritance of the Manassites. They did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Gazir. To this day, the Canaanites lived among the people of Ephraim, but are forced, required to do forced labor. This was the allotment for the tribe of Manasseh as Joseph's firstborn, that is, Machir, Manasseh's firstborn. Machir was the ancestor of the Gileadites, who had received Gilead and Bashan because of the Machirites were great soldiers. So this allotment was for the rest of the people of Manasseh, the clans of Abiezer, Helek, Asrael, Shechem, Hepha, and Shemida. These are the other male descendants of Manasseh, son of Joseph, by their clans. Now, Zelophehad, son of Hepha, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but only daughters, whose names were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Mikla, and Terza. They went to Eliezer the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the leaders, and said, the Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. So Joshua gave them an inheritance along with the brothers of their father, according to the Lord's command. Manasseh's share consisted of 10 tracts of land beside Gilead and Bashan, east of the Jordan, because the daughters of the tribe of Manasseh received an inheritance amongst the sons. The land of Gilead belonged to the rest of the descendants of Manasseh. The territory of Manasseh extended from Asher to Mikmethath, east of Shechem. The boundary ran southward from there to include the people living in En Tapua. Manasseh had the land of Tapua, but Tapua itself on the boundary of Manasseh belonged to the Ephraimites. Then the boundary continued south to the Cana Ravine. There were towns belonging to Ephraim laying among the towns of Manasseh, but the boundary of Manasseh was the northern side of the ravine and ended at the sea. On the south, the land belonged to Ephraim, on the north to Manasseh. The territory of Manasseh reached the sea and bordered Asher on the north and Issachar on the east. Within Issachar and Asher, Manasseh also had Beth, Shan, Iblium, and the people of Dor, Endor, Tarnak, and Megiddo, together with their surrounding settlements. The third in the list is Naphoth. Yet the Manassites were not able to occupy these towns, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that region. However, when the Israelites grew stronger, they subjected the Canaanites to forced labour, but did not drive them out completely. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, why have you given us only one allotment and one portion for an inheritance? We are a numerous people, and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. If you're so numerous, Joshua answered, and if the hill country of Ephraim is too small for you, go up into the forest and clear land for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and Rephaites. The people of Joseph replied, 
The hill country is not enough for us and all the Canaanites who live there in the plain. That they have chariots, iron chariots, both those in Bethshan and its settlements and those in the valley of Jezreel. But Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are numerous and very powerful. You will not only, you have not only one allotment, but the forested hill country as well. Clear it and its farthest limits will be yours. Though the Canaanites have iron chariots and though they are strong, you can drive them out. This is God's word. Thanks, Cathy. Uh, I, I think it's a nightmare when anyone has to read the names. You did well. That's only a year's worth of coffee. Um, but it is difficult, and I know that sometimes when you have to read lots of names like that, it can seem quite um, intimidating. But um, you did do well. You read that, and you kind of think, how on earth do you get anything out of that? Uh, if you think that's bad, try 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 through to 9, or through chapters 1 to 9, and it's just a list of names after names after names. So this is quite refreshing compared to that. But there is, uh, there is a lot to, to be said here, and what we're going to try and do this evening is just draw out a couple of principles that I think do come out of this passage that can be missed if you just read it as quickly as you can so you can move on to an easier reading. Just for the information of uh, you, particularly at the evening service, um, many of you should remember Michael Howell. Uh, Michael Howell was a part of our church about seven years ago. He's been in Brisbane now for seven years, been in City North as the uh, young adult associate pastor. Michael was ordained this morning in the church, finally, and has taken over or will be taking over once Murray has uh, worked out his, his, how long he continues before he retires. He's retired, but he's got to finish that, I think, to the end of the year, and then Michael will be taking over as senior pastor. They've appointed him. So that's a wonderful testimony to how God has worked in us. And you know my prayer when I look out, particularly when I see you young people out there, is I really pray that God would take some of you young people and raise you up into ministry areas. Some of you pastors, some of you missionaries, some of you women workers, uh, wherever the case may be. But I really do pray that God will keep on raising people up from this church and thrusting them out into full-time paid ministry. So when you hear the call of God and when he taps you on your shoulder, don't ignore him. Let's pray and ask for help. Now, Father, we are so grateful for your word. Uh, we recognize that sometimes it can seem a little bit intimidating and sometimes when you read through a list of names, it can seem even a little bit arbitrary. We don't mean to read it like that. But we do confess that sometimes we find difficulty in understanding and knowing how it applies to us. This evening, as we seek to draw out some principles, we pray that you would guide us. We pray that your word would not be treated disdainfully. We pray that it would be treated faithfully. We ask, Lord, that... Uh, those principles that do come out of this passage might be obvious to us as we go through them, and we pray that they would be helpful to us. We ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would take your word and bring it alive, make it real to us, and we pray that you would ultimately point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray this for his sake. Amen. When I was still living in South Africa, I had finished a round of golf. Yes, I even played golf back there. And um, I was on my way home, and I was driving out of the golf club uh, onto a road that would turn left. And it was in a, a quite a big estate. And the, the way that particular golf course worked is there was a prison on the opposite side of where the golf course was. And so they used to hire out the prisoners as caddies to you while you were playing golf. And it was very interesting talking to some of these prisoners and saying to them, you know, what are you in for? And the one guy, you know, I'm in for murder. And you think, oh, okay, well, uh, just make sure that you stay as far away from me as possible. Uh, but it, it, it was an interesting experience. And, and I'd finished the round, and I was driving out on a dirt road to turn left onto asphalt road, onto a tarred road. 
And in the process, as the sun was setting and coming into my eyes, I got into a bad habit of leaving sunglasses on my passenger seat. You didn't have those sunglasses things at the top where you could put your sunglasses back then. And so I just got lazy and left them on the seat. And so as I was driving out and getting ready to turn left, I looked down to pick up the sunglasses. And then as I looked up, I'd gone across into the road and there was a truck right on top of me, one of these five-ton trucks. And so I immediately slammed the brakes, it was too late, and I went into this truck and I bounced back and the car was a write-off. I was very grateful to the Lord that he kept me safe in that accident. But it was a reminder of how easily we get into bad trends, how easily it is to develop bad habits. And how dangerous those bad habits can become if we allow them to become settled in us. And I'd allowed this habit to become part and parcel of how I operated, and eventually it actually put my life at risk. And had I gone a little bit further into that road, I would have been hit by the truck and it would have been a different story altogether. I was very fortunate that I was going slowly and managed to bounce back off that truck. And Joshua raises in this particular text some dangerous trends, some dangerous trends that Christians can get into, that we need to guard against as Christians, and we need to ensure that we don't allow ourselves to develop dangerous trends in our lives that cause us to allow our Christianity to be compromised and our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ to be compromised. And though you may have missed some of these, they come out in the text. And the first one is the danger of domesticating God. Now, I've used my words deliberately. The danger of domesticating God. Verses 1 to 4 of chapter 16. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of the verses that we could read. The allotment for Joseph began at the Jordan of Jericho east of the waters of Jericho, and went up from there through the desert into the hill country of Bethel. It went on from Bethel, that is Luz, uh, crossed over to the territory of the Archites at Ataroth, descended westward to the territory of the Japhelites as far as the region of Lower Beth Horon and on to Giza, ending at the sea. So Manasseh, now here's the verse, you can easily read this and miss it, So Manasseh and Ephraim, the descendants of Joseph, received their inheritance. Now it's very interesting the way that he mentions that. Ephraim's allotment is mentioned first. And that you can easily read over with asking, without asking yourself, what is the significance of mentioning Ephraim before he mentions Manasseh? And if you know your history, and I'm sure you all do know your history, you'll know in Genesis 48, just before Jacob dies, he begins to pronounce blessings on his sons. In fact, someone has has labeled that chapter, these are uh, uh, Jacob's blessings, we don't want to know what his curses are. Because some of those blessings he pronounces on the 12, his 12 sons, sound more like curses than blessings. And one of the things that happens as he begins to pronounce these blessings on his sons is Joseph brings his two sons to him, Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh is the older boy, Ephraim is the younger. And so as was the convention back then, the older boy received double inheritance of the younger boy. And the older boy always took priority. But when Joseph comes, he takes the boys and he places them in such a way that if Jacob reaches out with his right hand to pronounce blessings, he's going to put it on Manasseh's head and the left hand on Ephraim's head. Now Jacob is going a little bit blind at this stage, but somehow he knows what Joseph has done because when he places his hands, he swaps them over and he places his right hand on Ephraim's head and his left hand on Manasseh's head. And Joseph pauses him and says, hang on, Dad, you've got this wrong. Ephraim is the youngest. Your right hand needs to be on Ephraim's head. You need to change order. And Jacob says, no, this is what God wants me to do. And so the younger is blessed first and the older second, completely reversing the order. Now, conventionally, you would think God was going to act in a particular way that would be consistent with the way 
uh, he, he was expected to act. And so there's a sense in which Joseph has kind of almost put this box around God and almost raised the expectations to say to God, this is how you must act. And God cuts right across uh, Joseph, and he says, no, I'm not bound by what you think I should and shouldn't do. I will act according to what I want to do. My purposes will prevail. And in spite of your thinking, I'm going to act in a way that is completely different to your expectations. And therein lies an incredible lesson for us. It's easy for us to try and domesticate God. It's easy for us to try and push God into certain boundaries. And we expect God to act in ways that we think are consistent with the way that our thinking goes. So that when there's a natural disaster, for example, and when people die as a result of that, or when there's a disaster like 9-11 and planes fly into buildings or bombs explode in Bali or whatever the case is, it's very easy for us to think in certain ways and for society to think in certain ways and say, well, how can God be a loving God if he allows things like this to happen? And there's a sense in which God cuts across all of that and says, I'm not bound by how you think I should act. I'm not a God who is restricted in a straitjacket and has to conform to your ideals and what you think is good and what you think is right and, and the way in which you think I should act. I will act independently of you because the purposes I have are much greater than your purposes. And the purposes I have sometimes are hidden from your sight. And so there are, are sovereign purposes that God is working out that you and I don't get insight to. And sometimes those purposes are completely different to what we would expect, to what we would think of how God should act. Now you see this throughout Scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 13, verses 14 to, uh, and v verses 16, 9 to 12, is the story of David being anointed. Now if you know, if you're familiar with the Old Testament story, Samuel is told to anoint David as king. And so he goes into David's father's house, Obed, uh, Jesse rather, and he gets all him to get all his sons lined up. And there's seven sons lined up. And this is how the story goes. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eli and thought, surely Yahweh's anointed stands here before Yahweh. But Yahweh said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. Yahweh does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance. Yahweh looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, Yahweh has not chosen him either. Jesse then made Shema pass by. But Samuel said, nor has Yahweh chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, Yahweh has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? You think seven is enough. There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then Yahweh said, rise and anoint him. Here's the one. This is completely against convention. Samuel, who's a prophet of God, expects God to anoint the oldest. God cuts across all of his sons and goes to the least likely candidate, David. I mean, David's not even present. Jesse considers David so inconsequential that he hasn't even summoned him from the, from the field to be present when Samuel arrives because it can't be David. David's a shepherd. And yet God chooses David. Why does God choose David? Well, listen to what God says in 1 Samuel 13, 14. It's to Saul, but your kingdom will not endure Yahweh sought a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept Yahweh's command. In other words, God's choice of David is because he looks into the depths of his being and he sees a man who has a heart after him. Now, when I read that and I read this account, it gives me incredible encouragement because God's not concerned 
with how you look. God's not concerned with your appearance. God's not concerned with how gifted you may be, how able you may be, how capable you may be. But God, in fact, sometimes cuts across whom we think are suitable and raises up people who seemingly, in our view, from a human perspective, may seem totally unsuitable. And sometimes God takes people that we overlook and God uses them and raises them up and thrusts them out into his kingdom. And it's very important for us to recognize and understand that because in a church situation, it's easy for us to look at the ones who are standing out and those who are more in the background and those who sometimes get overlooked but are quietly getting on with doing God's work. It's very easy for us to bypass them and think, well, they're not suitable. Or maybe the person doesn't have the kind of qualifications we think they ought to have in order to serve in a particular position. Maybe they're not educated enough. And so we can go on and list the reasons why not. And God says he chooses, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 following, he chooses the weak things of the world. He chooses the despised things of the world. And so the issue is not whether or not you are capable, but whether or not you have a heart after God. And God sees that. And God knows that. And even though everyone else might look at you and say, ah, oh, that person shouldn't be in full-time paid ministry. If God wants you in full-time paid ministry, then God will raise you up and God might cut across convention. You don't have to have the greatest education. And this is what makes God so refreshing because he's not subject to our thinking. He's not subject to our conventions. He doesn't operate the way we try and confine him to operate but is free to operate as he chooses. Isaiah 55 verse 9 declares, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to Yahweh our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may follow the words of his law. When we go through history, and when we look at the people that God has chosen to raise up in his word, they are, from a human perspective, entirely unsuitable. What about Peter? Peter, who's got foot and mouth disease, who every time he opens his mouth, he changes feet. Peter, who is the most unlikely of disciples, who's impetuous, impatient, blurts things out, and God raises up this man to write some books in the New Testament and commissions him as an apostle. What about Paul? Persecuting the church. Considered himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. Hated God, hated Christians. Approved the death of Stephen when he was being stoned. And yet God takes this man and plucks him out of his sin and turns his life around. And eventually he is martyred in the same way that others were martyred that he approved of. So can I encourage you? Maybe it is that God is saying to you this evening, I've got some work that I want you to do in full-time paid ministry. You may not seem suitable to everyone else, but I know what's in your heart. I know what lies beneath. And I can see into the depths of your being. And while everyone else might write you off, I've got plans for you to serve me in a full-time ca paid capacity. God will not be domesticated. God acts in surprising ways. God cuts across convention. And sometimes even when we begin to question him with things like sickness or, or uh, financial difficulties or relationship problems, sometimes God acts in ways that are completely different to the way that you and I thought. There's a wonderful story. This is a true story. I had to tell you this because it's so funny. This is a true story of how God cuts across convention. It's told by Dwight Nelson about the pastor of his church. He had a kitten 
that climbed up in a tree in his backyard and then was afraid to come down. Have you ever had that, a little cat climb up, a kitten? The pastor coaxed, coaxed the cat by offering it some warm milk. The, cat, uh, the kitten would not come down. The tree was not sturdy enough to climb, so the pastor decided if he tied a rope to his car and drove away so that the tree bent down, then he could reach up and get the kitten. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Then that's what he did. All the while checking his progress as he slowly inched forward in the car. He figured that if he went just a little bit further, the tree would be bent sufficiently for him to reach and get the kitten. But as he moved the car a little further forward, the rope snapped. The tree went bong, and the kitten instantly sailed through the air out of sight. The pastor felt terrible. He walked all over the neighborhood asking people if they'd seen his little kitten. No, no one had seen the stray kitten. So he prayed, Lord, I just commit this kitten to your keeping, and went on about his business. A few days later, he was in the grocery store and met one of his church members. He happened to look into a shopping cart and was amazed to see cat food. The woman was a cat hater, and everyone knew it. So he asked her, why are you buying cat food when you hate cats so much? She replied, you won't believe this. And then told him how her little girl had been begging her for a cat, but she kept refusing. Then a few days before, the child had begged again, and so the mom finally told her little girl, well, if God gives you a cat, I'll let you keep it. She told the pastor, I watched my child go into the backyard and get on her knees and ask God for a cat, and really, pastor, you won't believe this, but I saw it with my own eyes. A kitten suddenly came flying out of the blue with its paws outspread and landed right at her feet. God is able to do things that are completely out of the ordinary. Don't domesticate him. Don't limit God by putting him in a box. Don't expect God always to act the way that you think he should. God is full of surprises. He's much bigger than what we are. And sometimes he acts in refreshingly surprising ways for our good. Secondly, I want you to notice the determination in approaching God. Look at verse 17, 3 to 6, the determination in approaching God. This was the allotment for the tribe of Manasseh, as Joseph's firstborn, that is Makir, Manasseh's firstborn. Um, now, verse 3, Zelophehad, son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh had no sons but only daughters, whose names were Mahala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza. What names? Why would you name your children that anyway? They went to Eliezer the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the leaders and said, Yahweh commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. So Joshua gave them an inheritance along with the brothers of their father, according to the law's Lord's commands. Now what's really interesting there is daughters didn't get inheritance. Inheritance went to the males, went to the sons. And so the daughters were excluded from that whole thing. And these daughters of Zelophehad, they remember that their father has approached Moses. And if you were to turn in your Bibles to Numbers 26, 33 and Numbers 27, 1 to 11, you'll find the account there where Moses, as they approach him, as Zelophehad approaches him, says that he must give, when they allot the land, he must give some of the land to his daughters. And Moses agrees. So God cuts across convention, and he allows these daughters to inherit. And so they approach Moses confidently with a determination based upon the word of God. And one of the issues that you and I face, I think, sometimes is that we, pray, we can approach God rather timidly. We can approach God wondering whether or not God is actually going to answer our prayers, and particularly if our spiritual lives are a bit of a mess. 
Sometimes there may be a, a nervousness. You know, it's like when you go uh, to a hotel, not that we go to a hotel a lot, or you go to a shop and there's no one at the counter and it's got a little bell and it says ring the bell in order to get service. And sometimes you feel almost as though you shouldn't ring the bell because you might sound as though you're being impatient and, and maybe it sounds as though you're being a little bit um, forward. Well, it, it's that sense in which sometimes when we approach God, we come to Him with a sense of, I wonder if God is going to hear my prayer. I wonder if God is going to answer my prayer. I wonder if God is going to listen to me. And sometimes we base our prayer lives not on the finished work of Christ, but on our own uh, lives, on our own performance spiritually. And the writer to the Hebrews says, we should approach the throne of grace with confidence. We are confidently able to approach God, not because we are spiritually at the right point at which we should be, not because we have got all our I's dotted and all our T's crossed, not because we are living lives that are reflecting God's holiness or godliness. We may be away from the Lord, but there is a sense in which every believer, every true believer is able to approach God because Jesus Christ has opened up the way. Jesus Christ has enabled us to approach God. And so as a result of what the work of Christ, we can, like these daughters, confidently approach God. Our approach of God is based upon His Word. And so there ought to be a strong determination when we pray, when we come to God. We shouldn't come, in a sense, apologetically. And sometimes the devil whispers in your ears and says to you, you're not worthy to pray. Just look at your life. It's an absolute mess. What makes you think God is going to listen to you? And that doesn't mean we shouldn't deal with our sin. Of course we should. But it doesn't mean because of our sin, we can't approach God. In fact, it's the very reason why we should approach God. Because sometimes when we are estranged from God and our lives are not what they ought to be, the only place where we can find forgiveness is in approaching God. And we approach Him on the basis of the finished work of Christ. It is Jesus that has opened up the way. It is Jesus that enables us to come into the presence of God. And so we do this because of what Christ has done on the cross. And so like these daughters who approach Joshua and the leadership, their approach is based on what God has already declared. We approach God on what he has already declared. Our confidence is grounded in the word of God. And so when we pray, we come with that sense of confidence. Thirdly, I want you to notice the danger of disobeying God. I won't read the verses, verses 7 to 13. The danger of disobeying God. What's the disobedience here? It's the ongoing disobedience that the Israelites are plagued with right up until exile. One of the commands that God gave them, which we've already dealt with in Joshua, so I don't want to spend a huge amount of time going back over that, is that they were to clear the land. God gave explicit instructions Remove all the inhabitants out the land. God gives those instructions because he knows if they don't obey him, they're going to allow themselves to be caught up in the worship of idolatry. And they're going to end up worshiping the same gods that the surrounding nations worship. And so God wants them to clear the land and get rid of any temptation for them to indulge in idolatry. And rather than obey God, rather than remove the Canaanites, the Israelites allow the Canaanites to continue living. And what they do is they convert the Canaanites into slave labor. It's almost as if they're saying to the Lord, okay, we, we haven't quite removed all of them, but nevertheless, we've subjugated them. We've taken control over them. They're not going to exercise any influence over them. We've got this under control. And God says, you haven't. I asked you to clear the land. And it's not enough that you have subjected the land. It's not enough that they have become slave laborers to you. It's not enough that you have control. My command to you was clear. It was explicit. Remove them. And you haven't removed them. You've disobeyed me. And that disobedience was going to cost them dearly. 
It would result at the end of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21, and read it for yourself, where it, the book ends by saying, and everyone did as they saw fit in their own eyes. Here is a nation completely away from the Lord. And the story in the history of Israel is their repeated a flirtation with idolatry. They're repeated entering into the pagan religions of the surrounding nations and the nations they did not clear from the land till eventually God says, enough! And he removes them out of the land. Northern kingdom is taken care of in about, it's about 870 BC and the uh, southern kingdom in about, um, I'm just getting my dates mixed up. 786, sorry, 786, the northern, and the other one is, someone help me out, 187, 186. And they've taken out the land. And God would not tolerate disobedience. And Christian, we're in the same boat. It's easy for us to excuse our disobedience. It's easy for us to justify our disobedience. That's what they did. But, but Lord, we've, we've subjugated them. They're slaves. What's the big deal? We've got this under control. So I'll tell you something, you never control sin, ever. That's the mistake of secular society. They think they can control sin. You never control sin. It always controls you. And the disobedience of this nation is a reminder of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you love me, you will Obey my commands. You will live in obedience with me. And it is that importance of coming before the Lord and ensuring that we are bringing our lives under the control of God and not excusing and justifying our disobedience. It's so easy. You can justify anything. Isn't that what Saul did? It is one of, in my view, one of the saddest accounts along with Samson in Scripture, 1 Samuel 15. Remember the count? Saul has been told to go in and, and wipe out the nation that he is invading. Take them out completely. What does he do? He keeps the best of the sheep and the cattle. God's told him destroy everything. He doesn't. And then Samuel comes. And as Samuel approaches Saul... He says to Saul, what's this bleating I hear in my ears? And Saul says, oh, we've got it covered. We've got it covered. I know the Lord said we should destroy everything, but guess what I've done, Samuel? I've decided to keep the best of the sheep and the goats so that we can come up onto this hill and we can offer sacrifice to the Lord. You see, I'm going to sacrifice them anyway, so they're going to die, but I've kept them so that we can sacrifice and then you have these words, and I want to quote because I want to be sure that we hear this. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Do you see the premium God places on obedience? The, it's not an optional extra kind of thing. It is to ensure that we are ruthlessly committed to following the word of God and the commands he lays out in his word, not in a legalistic fashion. There is no joy in legalism. There's no pleasure we derive out of trying to force our obedience. Obedience arises out of our love for Jesus. We want to obey him because we love him. And so obedience is the fruit of that love. It is the expression of our love. And the moment you and I try and religiously obey God and try and conform to his word in an outward sense, it will become a tremendous burden to us. It will break us. It will make our Christianity joyless. It will cause us to do exactly what the Pharisees did to the Jews, to place burdens on them by adding a whole lot of rules to follow. And if Christianity becomes about following rules, then very soon you will become a disillusioned Christian. And you will want to throw up your arms and say, I'm out of here, I've had enough. It's too hard. 
Rather, as our love for the Lord Jesus Christ grows, and as we fall more in love with Him, naturally, our disposition will be more inclined towards wanting to please Him. And how do we please Him? We please Him by living in conformity to His will, by living in obedience to His commands, by taking the principles in God's Word and consistently applying them in our lives. It's too easy to excuse our obedience by justifying our disobedience. And if you were to measure your obedience today, how would you fare? Do you sometimes look at the Word of God that has straightforward commands and try and bend it? Try and find the exit clause, the escape clause, the, you know, the one that gives you reason to excuse what you're doing. When Jesus says, Fix your things on all those which are good and lovely and pure and holy, and your mind is fixed on anything but that. It's very easy to justify it by saying, Lord, I can't help it. Look at all the stuff that is visually coming into my eyes. You can avert your gaze, of course. And you can choose what you watch and what you don't watch. That's within your own power. Do we fight with God over those Areas where we think God is being too restrictive in our obedience. That somehow God is confining us and, and causing us to miss out on some of the pleasures of life because as Christians, you know, we, we, we can't do those things. Lord, don't, don't tell me that I need to dress modestly. I can dress any way I want. Lord, don't tell me there's certain places I should avoid because they're not good for my soul. And we exercise our independence, our freedom. And all the while, we damage ourselves spiritually. Do we sometimes try and relativize God's word? Try and change it a little bit here and there. Water it down. Not obey it explicitly. But kind of try and make it a little bit fuzzy. Or try and alter the meaning just a little bit so it fits in with what we want. There are so many issues where the church has got caught up in those kinds of things. Do we try and bend God's will to our will? Do we try and say to the Lord, what I want to do is more important. My time is my time, Lord. Don't tell me that I should be serving you when I'm so busy. I don't have time to serve you. William Booth, Salvation Army. This is incredibly challenging. When William Chapman met General Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, William, uh, uh, General Booth was 80 years old and heard him speak of his trials and conflicts and victories. The American evangelist then asked the general if he would disclose his secret for success. He hesitated a second, Dr. Chapman said. And I saw the tears come into his eyes and steal down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, Men with great opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that he would have all of William Booth that there was. And if there's anything of the power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. I will, number one, rise every morning sufficiently early and have five minutes, not less than five minutes in private prayer. Two, I will avoid all the babbling and idle talk in which I have so lately and sinfully indulged. Number three, I will endeavor to conduct myself a humble, meek, zealous follower of the bleeding lamb and by serious conversation and warning, endeavor to lead others to think of their immortal souls. Number four, read no less than four chapters of God's word every day. 
5. Strive to live closer to God and seek after holiness of heart and leave providential events with God. Number six, read this over every day or at least twice a week. God help me, enable me to cultivate a spirit of self-denial to yield myself as a prisoner of love to the Redeemer of the world. The secret of success for William Booth was total surrender to Jesus Christ. Are you and God fighting over something this evening? Is there some issue in your life that you're wrestling with God about? And you're at odds with Him? And you're struggling to yield that to Him? The cost of disobedience is high, let me tell you. It can have devastating consequences. The Israelites experienced it. Judas experienced it when he betrayed Jesus. Anais and Sapphira experienced it when they lied. And so can I encourage you not to go away feeling guilty. There's no point in feeling guilty. But to determine with the power of Christ in you to seek his help in living your life in reverent obedience to your master. God has saved you to be holy, called you to live in obedience, called you to follow him. And then fourthly, very quickly, the danger of discontentment in God. Verses 14 to 18 of chapter 17. The danger of discontentment in God. Notice how Ephraim and Manasseh complain. They're discontent. You haven't given us enough land. In fact, when you have a look at the allotment of land that is given to them, they have an incredibly large allotment of land given. Each tribe is given one allotment, but their one allotment is great. And coupled to that, they have the most fertile of all the land. And there's a sense in which they try and sound pious about their complaint. Do you notice how they approach Joshua? God has blessed us. God has made us into a, a large people. Look, look, we've got the blessing of God on us. We've got so many of us, and this is obviously a sign of God's blessing. And as a result of God having blessed us, we actually need more land. So can you give us more land? And Joshua cuts across their, their facade, if I can put their their pseudo-piousness and says to them, you want more land? I'll tell you how you get more land. Clear out the Canaanites. You've got so many people. You've got all this great numbers. Well, you've got a great army. So get on with it and clear out the land. Clear out the forest area and you've just expanded your territory by clearing out the forest area. Oh no, we can't do that, they say. Because they, 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 these guys have got chariots, iron chariots, which was quite a revolution. It's like a, a nation having missiles and another nation not having missiles. And, and we can't attack them because they're going to overpower us. And that is a distrust in the word of God. What does God say to them? In Deuteronomy 7, verse 17 to 22, let me read these verses to you to remind you. Deuteronomy 17, you may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what Yahweh your God did to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. You saw with your own eyes the great trials and miraculous signs and wonders, the mighty hand and outstretched arm with which Yahweh your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to the people you now fear. Moreover, Yahweh your God will send the hornet among them, even a Even the survivors who hide from you have perished. Do not be terrified by them. For the Lord your God who is among you is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive out these nations before you. Little by little, you will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once. All the animals will multiply around you. Here is God saying to the nation, don't be scared. You've got Almighty God on your side. The God who created the universe. The God who speaks and reality is created. This is the God who stands behind you. What are you scared of? A few people with iron chariots. What a disgrace. God's power is not limited by the power that humans might possess. We are but dust. God looks down upon his creatures on the earth 
and on the circle of the earth, and he laughs. Who are we that we can oppose God? Who are we that we can shake our fist in the face of Almighty God? Who ultimately is going to prevail? God. And so, in effect, Joshua says, get on with it. Clear the land. God's on your side. And what does Ephraim say? No. Be too scared. They're too great. They're too big. Joshua calls their bluff, exposes their fraud, reveals their duplicity. They won't trust God. They're discontent. They won't put their faith in him. It's much easier to complain than look at the, poss the possibilities of what God can do. And it's very easy in our own lives to end up getting into this discontentment with God. We don't have what we think we ought to have and allow discontentment to cause us to distrust God and not to trust Him to do things that, from a human perspective, are impossible. Luke 137, Jesus says, nothing is impossible with me. God can do all things. What is the impossible thing that you are battling with right now? What is it? What is the thing that you're unwilling to trust God with? Is it the salvation of someone who's lost that you know? Is it a bad marriage? Is it no marriage, singleness? Is it a besetting sin that has entangled you? Is it a financial dilemma? Is it a physical issue that you're grappling with? Is it a mental issue? What is that thing that you just won't hand over to God and say, okay, Lord, you're the God of the impossible. Instead of complaining, I'm going to lay it at the foot of the cross and I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to watch what you do. Oh, that we would have faith that sees beyond the visible and looks into the invisible realm and sees the great God we serve and what that God can do. I'm convinced it would transform us. Doesn't Jesus say in Matthew 7, knock, seek, knock and the door will be open, seek and you will find, ask and it will be given to you. Does not a father, parent, Give to their children what they ask. How much more will your heavenly Father give you what you ask? But you must ask, you must trust, you must believe. We serve a great God. We stand on the word of God. We appropriate the promises of God. We pray those promises. And we trust God to do from a human perspective, what is impossible. Will you let that thing go? Will you hand it over? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your greatness. What an incredible God you are. We bow humbly before you. You can do anything according to your will, according to your purposes. Nothing is too hard for you. Your arm is not too short. You own the cattle in a thousand hills. Forgive us when our faith is so small that we limit you. Forgive us when our discontentment causes us to distrust you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to look beyond what we see. Give us a stronger, more robust faith that trust you to do what we cannot do in and of ourselves, whatever it is. And I pray that you would help us to learn to walk hand in hand with the master, to walk according to your precepts and your ways, that in all we do, our lives might be a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ and our love for him, for Jesus' sake.